Tonight we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 6. We're going to start in verse 12. Where last week we, we discussed the situation of lawsuits. And how lawsuits apply to our lives as Christians. How we're supposed to handle and how we're supposed to deal with those situations. And today we're going to talk about our body being that of the Lord's. And how Paul begins to lay the groundwork for how Christians are to function in day-to-day -day lives. How we're to function every time that we get out in public. Because unfortunately, even though we are to be separate from the world, which is called sanctification, we are still yet a part of the world. We still have to deal with the world. And we have to make sure that our dealings with the world does not begin to infect our relationship with God. And we see here in, in verse 12 is where we'll start. I'm going to pray in just a second. We see that Paul is warning the early church about our cravings for those things of the world. Because even though we are now separate from the world, do you ever find yourself still kind of bending toward the world? Is that, or is that just me? Does that old man raise up at times? Does it have desires to do things that we know we should not do or take part of because of that old man that lived within us? And we have to make sure that we are living appropriately. And that's what we're going to talk about. Some of the wording here can be tricky. But the wording here is going to play a part in what we're going to study in a couple of weeks. Now next week we're going to jump chapter 7. Just because we have children in attendance. And some of the discussion in chapter 7 can get a little dicey. Um, so that we don't have questions when we get home about certain matters that we're going to discuss. You would read it and you'll see what I'm talking about, um, the meaning of chapter 7. So I'll hit chapter 7 when the kids get in the yard. We'll go back to chapter 7. So anyway, verse 12, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12. Let me open this prayer. Dear God, I thank you for yet another day, another opportunity to read your word, another opportunity to study God. Pray, Father, that you'll be with our church, Lord. I pray, God, that you'll give us wisdom that we do not possess. Help us to know exactly how to proceed, how to walk. And God, I pray, Father, that you will energize our church. Give us a passion and a desire for evangelism. In your precious and your powerful and holy name, I pray, God. Amen. So we see here that Paul has just got done talking about taking lawsuits, taking worldly disputes in the church to the world to be dictated on how to handle them. Well, now he talks about something that's a little bit different. is how to handle ourselves and our spiritual freedom. Everybody knows that when we accept the Christ, we are free. God gives us a spiritual freedom. Did we just blow up? Are you doing something? A spiritual freedom. But we have to be careful not to abuse that privilege. Because the Corinthian church began to get in their minds a saying that the Greeks often said is, if it's permissible, then you should be able to do it. That if God created it, then could it possibly be bad? Has anybody ever heard that? Y'all hear the marijuana speech? Well, God made it grow, so should we be able to smoke it? Now, who's heard that? God grew tobacco, so shouldn't we be able to smoke it, right? God made mushrooms, so shouldn't we be able to eat them and get high? There's a whole list of those things. Pops and all these other things in the world. So what he is saying here is that our freedom cannot override our service to God. And that's where we're going to start in verse 12. It says, all things are lawful for me. So when you begin to look at that, it's not like Paul saying all things are good to go. That you can do anything with your freedom of God. Because we even know that Paul tells the church that what? Don't sin just to sin, right? Right? He said, if you sin just to sin to ask forgiveness, heavens no, we don't even want to do that. But he starts here by saying, all things are lawful for me. So the important word to really grasp here is the word lawful. He's saying that all things that the world deems lawful may is not good for the Christian. Now, does that mean I can partake in all things that are lawful? Example, I'm a Christian. It's lawful to drink in the United States of America. And as a Christian, could I drink under the law and not get put in jail? Yes. All things are lawful for me in that. He's not saying things that are unlawful. 
He's saying all things that the world considers fair, that all things that the world considers capable of being done, he said that all these things are lawful for me. Because what? I'm human. Humans have laws. We have things that we follow. Things that if we break, we go to jail. But there's things that the world permits that the church does not. Is that not true? Don't the world permit lying? Is it lawful to lie? People don't like it, but they don't put nobody in jail for it. Same thing on the flip side. As Christians, there's things that this world holds that we cannot, even though we are allowed to, by the world to partake, as Christians, we can't get entangled with. He says, but not all things are profitable. When I began to look at this, I was thinking, what is profitable mean? What does profitable mean? A beneficial value to me. That even though I am capable of partaking in the world and the world systems, because that's what the lawful is talking about here, is the world systems. Even though I am capable of doing whatever the law says that I can do, is it profitable for me to do as a Christian? There's a lot of things in this world that are that way. Abortion taken. Abortion is a legal act in the United States of America. Right? Legally, through the world standards, I can have an abortion. Or I can't, but I can have my wife can have an abortion in this country. Christians are free to fall and to do that. But the question comes in, is it profitable? Because we know what God's stance is on the issue. It says next, all things are lawful for me. He repeats it. But I will not be mastered by anything. So Paul now begins to get to the crux of what he is saying. He said, even though the world condones things, and even though the systems of the world allows the people of the world to do things, and they don't look down on it, and they don't look, think anything is wrong with it, even though the world has things that they allow to happen, that does not mean that it is profitable. And what it does mean for the Christian is that it becomes your master. Is that not true? How many times do things of this world that are lawful, that people accept, that the world accepts, that when the Christian partakes of it, it becomes their master? How about the love of money? Does the world condone the love of money? Anybody? Does the world condone the love of money, right? Get all you can get, can all you can get, sit on the can, right? Money is the, the root of all evil is what the Word of God says. So even though it is worldly capable for me to amass money and to love money and the world won't look down on me for it, God says that it becomes my master. How many people do you know that their master is money? They work long hours, work five jobs to make money, completely disregard Christ. Loving each other. The world says, what? Love oneself. Look out for who? Number one. Try to make yourself happy. That's what the world says. If you look out for number one in the world, will the world look down on you? No, what do they say? That's what you're supposed to do, right? Look out for number one. Burger King even says it. What? Your way, right away. It's all about you. But the Bible says that we are to love one another. So if we follow the world systems as a Christian, they become our master. How? Because the Word of God says... That a house, remember Jesus even says, they said Jesus was serving the Satan. He said a house divided against itself shall not stand. So as a Christian, we are either going to serve God and seek His plan, or we are going to serve the world and seek its plan. So if we have any of the world in our spiritual life, who are we serving? The world. And Paul is saying here, that we cannot be mastered by the world. And that's where we're going to start. Keep that in mind. It's the world's system that he is talking about. Because he's using this scripture in a dual form. Because we're going to talk about prostitution in just a minute. Not in depth. We're not going to go into any detail. But 
prostitution was going on in the Corinthian church because that was going on in the Greek world and that's how they worshipped. So the Corinthian people believed that since the Greeks said it was lawful to partake in prostitution, then naturally Christians could do that because it was lawful. And what he is saying here is that's not lawful. So when you look at this scripture, many people say, well, how does that pertain to us? We all know that's outlawed in our country. Nobody's partaking in that. That's just hooey. But I'm going to show you. That's what we're going to talk about. Because it's not strictly that. Paul's using that as the driving point for a greater lesson. And that greater lesson is what we have to grasp in our own Christian walk. He says in verse 13, how do we go from being mastered to what? Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. But God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and for the and the Lord is for the body. So I always remember when I told you about Paul. Paul starts on the base level. The foundational level is what? Not everything that's lawful is good for Christians to do. He went ahead and set that basis. So now to build upon that, he comes back and talks about food. Well, to the Jewish people that he's talking to, the Jewish Christians, they understood the food restriction, right? Because they had things that they could not eat that were not kosher. So they kind of had an understanding. So Paul started with what they understood. But here we can't take food for what it really looks like it represents. Does it mean food? Yes, it means food. But here's what he's talking about. Not the food itself, but the appetite which drives the food or the desire for food. Would you ever say that in your life, your sin is an appetite? Who who's that says they've ever had an appetite for sinning? Y'all ever know? That's when y'all do this. You don't ask for permission. You ask for forgiveness. Right? You have an appetite for sinning. So here he is saying that the food that they know about, because everybody gets hungry, is for the belly. Now if you look at the Greek here, stomach basically means anywhere in here. And stomach and belly also ties to the heart. So not only is he talking about food being a desire of our appetites physically, but he's talking about sin being an appetite of our heart. Then he's saying what? Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. But God will do away with both of them. As Christians, we're going to have appetites and desires because we're human. And we're going to think that by taking part in those appetites and those desires, which were created by God, then that gives us a reason to do them. Anybody ever been there before? Y'all ever used that? Some of y'all maybe when y'all were dating. Oh baby, I love you. This is just a natural part of life. Right? We all use that. And God created it. It's good. He then says this, Yet the, but God will do away with both. Right? Eventually when we die, go to heaven, do you think we're going to have an appetite? I don't know. Why do we need to eat? We'll have glorified bodies. And I hope mine looks way better than this one. And functions way better than this one. But I don't know. But he says he's going to do away with our physical desires. Because I believe when we get to heaven, we're not going to desire worldly things. Because the appetites of this world is what ties us to this world. But when we die and are reborn in Christ and have a new home and a new body, are we going to crave the things of the world? No, we're going to crave the things of God. So he says that that's going to pass away. He said, yet the body is not for immorality. Okay? So magically it went from food. If we were thinking it was just food, now we're really shocked. How do we go from a pizza to immorality? But what he's saying is our appetite for the world cannot stand and serve and be in the same place if we know God. He says, because yet the body is not for immorality. That even though I have a desire to sin, do y'all still have a desire to sin? Yes? No? Who still has a desire to sin? I want to see some hands because I feel like I'm the only sinner. There's times I have a desire to sin. 
that even though that desire is still there, I am not controlled by my immorality because of Christ. I make a conscious effort to buy in to my immorality. Is that true? Immorality is hardcore sin. Ain't that what all Christians think? When you see the word immoral. But let's look at the base of what immorality is. What is M? Normally determined as not. Morality. What is morality? What are morals? The right thing to do. So immorality is knowing the right thing to do, but choosing to do the opposite. Normally it's tied to sexual immorality, right? There's other forms of immorality. And he says here, he says this, Now God has not only raised... Well, I let me finish the backside of that other. But for the Lord. So our body is not for immorality now that we have Christ. Our body and our appetites now are for who? The Lord. So the Lord overrides our worldly desires and our worldly passions. He says, and the Lord is for the body. Now y'all see that? We just said that our appetites, our natural appetites, our human worldly appetites are there to fulfill our desires and our wants. But if we have Christ in our lives, then our appetite is no longer that of the world's, but it should be of that of the Lord's. So that our bodies cannot be mastered because we have the Lord. He says, now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through His power. So what's he talking about? God was raised from the dead to abolish our penalty of sin, or justification. Everybody here been justified, sanctified, glorified eventually, right? We all been fried, not fried, but fried. We don't want to be fried. That means that we go on the other end. But it says, now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise up through his power us, right? So now those desires we used to possess, we are free from those desires. Are we free from them by our own personal ability. Has any of y'all willed yourself not to sin? Apart from God, you didn't even know you were in sin. How many people before salvation had no realization that they were doing anything wrong because they were following what was lawful to the body and what was lawful by the country, right? So when we have Christ within us, we are now raised with Christ we are now justified, which means now we have to be sanctified. Sanctified meaning set apart. Does that mean we're going to stumble? Yes, we're going to stumble. Does that mean we're going to fall? Yes, we're going to fall. But it means we cannot live there. Our appetites cannot be wet on the sins of this world. Christians can't live in that environment. And he says in verse 15, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ. Does that change things? What about before you go to sin? You realize that you have Christ within you. That that sinful thing that you're fixing to do, say you're going to hold off and slap your mom-in-law. Before you slap your mom-in-law, how would it make you feel if you know that you're going to slap your mom-in-law with Jesus' hand? Some of y'all thinking, I'd steal that Jesus slapper. The point is this. When we have Christ within us, then the sin that we partake of, we are dragging Christ into. Because He is now where? Within us. So we are not only sinning with our own body, but we are sinning with a body that God now lives in. Sometimes I think God lives within our body and He has to clean out the cobwebs continually and, and sweep the floor because we keep the house that He lives in a little dirty. It says this, Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Whoa. 
Now he done went off the deep end. Because that's what they were dealing with then. And right now you might be thinking, oh my Lord, there's no way I would partake in that. But what we have to look at here is that the prostitute word here, that that is not only talking about what was actually happening, but it applies to us today because it is talking about violating and, and condoning what the world says is okay and yet what God says is not. That's the line there. That not only was it lawful then, but it was also being practiced by people of the church in church services. Prostitution was common. And what Paul is saying is that that, even though it's lawful, as Christians, when you partake in that, you have to realize that Christ lives within you. So even though you have the freedom that Christ gave through the sanctification of your soul, by the justification of your soul through the death of Christ on the cross, that even though you have that grace, it does not give you a license to discredit God who now lives within you. We can't make that choice. Because he says next what? May it never be. So you might be saying, well, I don't have to worry about that because I don't partake in prostitution. Well, I hope not. But the point here is this. When we were united with Christ, if you ever look in the Bible, when we're talking about going to heaven, we are called the what of Christ? The bride of Christ. That means we are in a covenant relationship with God. When we accept Christ into our lives, we are in a covenant relationship as husband and wife to our God. This is your life, your husband and your wife relationship should be an indication and a picture of our relationship with God. We are now in a loving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are tied to Him. Would you want your husband or wife, while you're tied to them, to be partaking in prostitution? Because whatever they were subjected to, they would now be bringing it home to you. And in the kingdom of God, what He is saying is this. You are bought by the blood of Christ. You are now the bride of Christ Himself. So you can no longer partake in the things of this world, even though the world condones it, and even though the world says it's okay. You can no longer be tied to that. Because when you violate God's relationship with you by being mastered by the world, essentially... You are cheating on God. How would you feel if your loved one cheats on you? And I'm sure that's how God feels every time we partake willfully in immorality. Then he says in verse 16, Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one with a body with him, with her? For he says, The two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with Him. So now that we are the Lord's, we are combined. That's that covenant marriage relationship I'm talking about that now we have with Christ. We now belong to Christ. And since I belong to Christ, should I still have an appetite for the world? And if I have an appetite for the world, am I indulging myself in those appetites? Because if I am, I am violating willfully the love covenant relationship that I have with Christ. We're talking about willful sin. We're not talking about I hit my finger with a hammer and say a dirty word accidentally. We're talking about willfully sinning willfully partaking in the world systems because the world allows it and because the world condones it and because the world says it's okay. And when we enter into that covenant relationship with the world, even though we're in a covenant relationship with Christ Himself, we have now become immoral. Because we should be faithful to who? Christ. 
Just like we're faithful to our husbands and hateful and hateful to our wives and faithful to our wives, we should that way same be to God. That we should honor our relationship. If you know your wife is hurt by a decision that you are going to make, you would be an awful husband to make that decision anyway. If you as a wife knew that your husband had shortcomings and failures and you rubbed those in his face every time you had a chance, you would be an awful wife. But as Christians, we immorally partake in what the world offers because it's easy and because it's fun and because it's enjoyable. All the while cheating on a relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ who gave it all for us. That's what he's saying, that when you left and when you got married, remember in your wedding vows, they said that you are to leave your mama and cleave to your wife, right? That leave and cleave principle. That no longer does mama call the shots in your house. That's how you have a happy marriage. Is that true? Can your mama in law make the decisions in your house and you have a happy home? No. So when we were married and united with Christ, now our relationship with Christ should dictate our service to Him and our service to each other. We can no longer allow the mama-in-law of the world to dictate how we are going to conduct ourselves in that relationship. And that's what Paul is saying. That even though it's lawful by world standards, it means it's not lawful because you are, you are tied to Jesus Christ Himself. And that when you go out into the world and live an immoral life, you are dragging Christ into that life. You are pulling Christ Himself down to your level because you share a oneness and one in spirit. This is what He says. And whenever I see this, I always think about Joseph and Potiphar's wife. When it says, flee immorality. Now when you hear the word flee Paul is not saying this. Right? Or I'm going to just stand. I'm going to socially distance myself from the world. I'm going to get six feet from it. Or the world is the pool of life. I'm not going to put my body in. But I'm going to check my toe for check the temperature. No, he says flee. Y'all remember when Joseph Potiphar's wife calls Joseph down in the cellar? And she done been trying to get him for about six months. And she thought he had him cornered. And remember, she took hold of his coat. And what did Joseph do? Shucked off the coat and fleed. It said he physically ran from that temptation and that immorality. So as Christians, since we are tied to Christ because of his justification and sanctification, when we come in contact with that which could drag us into immorality and make us cheat on the loving relationship that we have with God... When we see that, we should what? Flee. Just like I am sure if Larry got out in the, on the town and a lady come up and said, would you go on a date tonight? He would flee. Now, it might not be because of God. It might be because he's scared that Martha would hit him with a stick if she found out. See? But the point is this. Christians have to learn to flee immorality because we are tied to Christ. And because when people see us, they see Christ. Because here's another example since I already started using Larry. It'll go out into the world that Larry's cheating on Martha. But say Larry decided to go out with the woman. Martha didn't know it. And Beverly seen Larry... At the Shoney's with a new woman. Right? Y'all following me? Now Larry's violating his love relationship with his wife. And Beverly has seen it. And she has always known Larry and Martha to be what? Mary. So now she sees that he is what? Cheating on his first love. Does that give Beverly... Any good thoughts about Larry? No. She will be calling Martha before he sits down at the Shoney's. And then Larry will be murdered when Martha gets to the Shoney's. 
The same thing happens when we tie ourselves to Christ in salvation. People learn that we are saved. They know that we go to church. And then they see us cheating on God by acting like the world. Do they want a relationship with God? No, because they say it must not be that good if he's cheating on them. Or why do I want to be the person that he is? He says one thing and lives another way. So he says, flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside his body. What he's basically saying is every other sin is something we accidentally fall into. Right? Anybody accidentally fall into sin? Daily, right? But immorality, the immoral man, sins against his own, what? Body. How? He takes it into himself. This talks about a relationship outside of marriage, right? There's nothing good that comes from immorality outside of marriage between a couple. The same thing, that same immorality is taking within the heart of a Christian when they, what? Cheat on God. Anybody ever done something immoral and you knew God knew about it and then it affected your relationship with God? Men, have you ever done something that you knew you shouldn't have? Now, it might not have been cheating. It might not have been something major. It might have been something minor. But you knew you did it. And you knew that if your wife found out about it, you wouldn't be able to rest for a month and a half. So rather than to tell her, you hide your immorality. And because women naturally have a spirit of discernment, and they can see when you ain't acting right, not unless you crooked, you avoid a relationship with them because you don't want what? Your sin to be found out. So what happens to us in our relationship with God? We internalize our sin because we think God don't know about it. And then we realize that God knows about it. And then we don't want to talk to Him. And we don't want to read the Word because now we've internalized our sin and our immorality. And we don't want to turn loose of it. And we know it violates the relationship that we have with God. But we love the world better than we love our, our God. So we get caught in a conundrum. Do I sell out the world and go for Christ? Or do I ride the fence? And the Word of God says that a lukewarm Christian makes God want to vomit. The word's vomit. Gross. So our immorality is something that we take within ourselves that we have to rid ourselves of. He says, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Verse 19 says, or do you not know that your body is a temple? What does it mean? The temple in the Old Testament, right, had the Ark of the Covenant, which was the representation of who? God, right? So God dwelled in the temple through the Ark of the Covenant, through the Holy of Holies, through the high priest and the sacrificial system. So the temple, physical, was a house of God. Upon God, Christ's death and resurrection, the Holy Spirit now dwells in the lives and the hearts of the believer. So no longer do we have a physical temple. That's why this isn't the church. That's the church. Why? Christ now dwells within us. So Paul's saying, don't y'all know y'all are the temple. You've got the Holy of Holies living within you. That your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you, that you, here's the important part, are not your own. If you read over the next chapter, when he starts talking about marriage, and if you remember when, Christ, when you're talking about marriage at your own marriage ceremony, you say the two have now become what? One. You are no longer, he uses the same language next to talk about a marriage relationship. You are no longer your own. When me and Melinda got married, it was no longer just me. Every decision that I make 
now affects Melinda. So when we accept Christ and the Holy Spirit within our lives, every decision that we make now affects God, God's ministry through us, and God's kingdom. True? He says that you are not your own. Now God lives within you. You can't make all the decisions. You don't know what decision to make. And he says in verse 20, For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Just like in past times, when you got married, you paid the father-in-law what? A dowry. If she was really nice, you give them three goats. Not so much, maybe a bird. But you gave a dowry to pay for the bride that united you as one. So when you come into this covenant relationship with God, you enter that relationship with a dowry. God bought and paid for you warts, lumps, and all. So because He bought you with a price, you are now no longer your own, and everything that you do affects Him. Just like if I entered into a marriage relationship and I paid a dowry for my wife, we are now one in the eyes of the law. When you file your taxes, most people file jointly. In the eyes of the world, we become what? One. In the eyes of God, we become one. When we come to know Christ, we become one with Christ. We are no longer our own. So when we partake in the immorality of this world, we violate the covenant relationship we have with Christ. And not only do we affect ourselves, but we affect the kingdom of of God. So just like you stay faithful to your wife or your husband because you love him dearly, we should stay faithful to God because we love him dearly. Not because we're scared, not because we we're afraid that he's going to kill us, but we do that because what? We love him. And it makes immorality easier and sin easier to deal with when you deal with it out of love and not deal with it out of fear. So in the end, everything you do when you take on the mantle of Christ is a representation of Christ. Every decision we make is a representation of Christ. When people look at our church, do they see Maple Cane or do they see Christ? They see Christ. We're going to be measured by the standard of Christ. So we have to be careful that even though things are lawful and even though the world makes things attractive and even though the government might say it's okay to do these things, if it violates Christ, if it violates His standards, if it violates His statutes, we as Christians cannot partake in that immorality because God says so. Not because Uncle Sam says so. Not because the senators and the governors and the mayors say so. It's because Christ sets the standard for your spiritual life, not this world. Because if you begin to allow this world to set the standards for your life, then you do not belong to Christ you now are mastered by the world. And we've got Christians everywhere that are being mastered by the world and mastered by what the world can fabricate and they are severing that love relationship they have with God because they're not willing to stand firm with Him and reject the world. And that's where we're at. Next week we'll start in chapter 8 and we'll be inside... 6.30, we're going to do our children's graduation. And then we'll go into our service as following our children's graduation. Glad that you had everybody. Glad that everybody was here tonight. I'm going to say a prayer real quick before I let you go. Think about that this week. Remember, you are bought with a price. You are in a loving relationship with God. And we need to live like it.
Our church has to live like that. Our, our, we have to live like that. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for another day. Pray, God, that you'll give us wisdom, give us comfort, give us peace. Help us to know how to live and how to walk in you. In your precious and your powerful name, I pray, God. Amen.